everybody, this is Mr. Workman, and what I'm going to do is go through some examples of writing, or drawing rather, bore models, which are really, really rudimentary and very generic diagrams that show you what we call the configuration, uh, which is the arrangement and the placement of subatomic particles in certain types of atoms. In order to be able to do this, you've got to do some interpretation in the periodic table. So what we should start with is an example set of information for a particular element. So what I'm going to do here is just draw um, a box. And there's a bunch of these boxes on the periodic table. You know that the periodic table has this general shape like this, right? And then, and then there's some other elements down here. Right, so um, anyway, um, one of these boxes, what I'm talking about is just you know one of these particular boxes, um, is what you'd see here. So what I'm going to do is take this first particular element, which has a number one up here, and then of course it has this symbol, uh, which is the letter H, and then it has a number down here, and you can see. Um, you know, in a variety of um, periodic tables, the, the number down at the bottom is rounded up or rounded down, as the case may be, um, to slightly different numbers. I'm just going to use 1.009 um, here, and let's talk about what that information means. This number on the top in each of those boxes in the periodic table, of course, is called the atomic number. And that atomic number, of course, will tell you the number of protons found in a particular atom of this element. And it will also tell you the number of electrons. But it only tells you the number of electrons if you're talking about um, a neutral atom. This number, of course, down here is what's referred to as the average atomic mass. And the atomic mass, of course, is um, what this is, is the number of protons. plus the number, or the average number, of neutrons. That, of course, is a number that can change. Uh, the numbers of neutrons can vary in different, um, in the same elements, in different atoms of the same element. So what you can do is take a look at the difference between these two numbers that little triangle, of course, means difference. The difference between the atomic number and the uh, average atomic mass number, and that triangle, again, means difference or change. So the difference between the atomic number and the average atomic mass will tell you, will give you the number of neutrons. Oops. Now, in this particular example, what we do is take that 1.0097 and subtract 1, and we get 0 0.0097, which is a really, really small number. Now, I'm not going to have 0.0097 neutrons in an atom. And as far as we know, neutrons only come in whole numbers. So once you get this number round to the closest whole number,
which in this case is 0. And that is my number of neutrons. Um, this number, of course, this 1.0097, that's an average. So what that means is, on average, most hydrogen atoms will have zero neutrons. But there are some hydrogen atoms up there, out there in the universe that have more than zero neutrons, uh, one or two, as we uh, understand it. And so what happens is, although that those particular circumstances are rare for a hydrogen to have more than zero neutrons, one or two, they must exist because our average mass for hydrogen is slightly above one. Now, you can take this information and make a drawing. And that drawing is what we're going to call a Bohr model. And what I'm going to do is start by looking at my inventory based on the information that's in this box. Now this tells me the number of protons, and if we are talking about a neutral atom, it also tells me the number of electrons. And I also did some math here to figure out that I'm going to have zero neutrons. So I'm just going to start drawing, and the way I'd like you to symbolize protons is with a P plus. There will be no neutrons in this particular hydrogen atom. So I'm not going to draw anything else, but I am going to draw, uh, I'm not going to draw anything else in the nucleus, but I am going to draw this, which is a little dot with a circle, and that's going to represent my electron with one little uh, orbital around my nucleus. And I can make a little list here of my inventory. There's one proton, there are zero neutrons, and there is one electron. So P plus and N with a little zero in superscript, and then uh, lowercase e with a uh, minus sign in superscript. Those are our symbols for protons, neutrons, and electrons, respectively. Now, if a hydrogen atom is going to turn into an ion, it's going to follow one of two rules. In general, you should know that what atoms are doing when they're turning into ions is becoming more stable as a result. They're going to fill their outermost level, or in some circumstances, empty their outermost level for electrons. That outermost level is called uh, the valence level. So just a couple notes here. When atoms turn to ions, They either fill or they empty their valence levels. The valence level is known as the outermost electron level. Now, <clears throat> this first little level for electrons that hydrogen has only has the capacity for two electrons. So what hydrogen will do is actually, generally, it's going to empty this level and just become a plus one ion. Well, how are you going to know that? Well, let me give you a couple of rules here. <clears throat> Atoms with three or fewer, which means less, of course, electrons in their valence level they tend to lose them and become positive what we call cations so Let's say, for example, this electron were lost. What we would have is still one proton, zero neutrons, and now zero electrons. And I would just simply draw this like that. That, that just one proton, 
This is my Bohr model of my hydrogen cation. It's a plus one. I can write it this way, H plus. It's a one charge, uh, plus one charge cation. That's it. Let's look at one other example. How about we try magnesium here? A magnesium atom, Bohr model. Well, what we need to do is uh, look at our information from the periodic table. So I'm going to copy what's on my periodic table here. And I see a 12 there. I see a capital M and a lowercase g there. And the particular periodic table that I'm looking at shows 24.31 as the average atomic mass. So what I'm going to do is draw my atom of my Bohr model. I'm going to draw in 12 protons. That number comes right from here. This periodic uh, table has the atomic numbers on the top of each box. And then I'm going to look at the difference between these two numbers. Now this 24 Let's see, 24.31 minus 12, that's 12.31. So that tells me my number of neutrons on average. OK, so most magnesium atoms will probably just have 12 neutrons. As it happens, magnesium happens to have, typically, the same number of neutrons as protons. And of course, that's not always the case. And if I need an atom, an atom, of course, is when my number of protons is equal to my number of electrons. That's what makes an atom an atom. If they're unequal, that means I have an ion. So let me draw my two electrons in, in this first orbital. Now I need, let's see, two. I need 10 more. So I'm going to put eight in the second orbital, or the second level, as they're called. Now I'm up to 10, and I need two more. So I'm going to put two electrons in a third level. And so now what I have in my inventory list here, I have 12 protons, I have 12 neutrons, as it happens, and also 12 electrons. That is my Bohr model. Now, how is this going to turn into um, an ion? Well, let's go back to our rule here. Atoms with three or fewer electrons in their valence tend to lose them and become positive cations. So let's look at magnesium here. How many electrons are in the valence level? One. Two. There are two valence electrons. So what do you think is going to happen here? Well, according to that rule, those two electrons should be lost. Now, if I lose two electrons, the result is I'm going to end up with 10 total electrons. So if I'm going to do the magnesium ion Bohr model, do is draw in my 12 protons, my 12 neutrons, and eight electrons in that second level, and that's it. So in contrast, you can see I've got 12 protons, I've got 12 neutrons. And now I have 10 electrons, 2 in the first level and 8 in the second level, 2 plus 8, that adds up to 10. So now what this means is I have two more protons than I do electrons because these are positively charged and these are negatively charged. The difference between these two will tell me my charge is a plus 2. So the way I write this, of course, is a magnesium 2 plus cation. Let's quickly look at an example of an element that, instead of losing electrons, will tend to gain electrons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a Bohr model of oxygen. Let's do an oxygen atom Bohr model first. Let's look at our information from the periodic table. Let's look at that box. An oxygen Bohr model, uh, we're going to look at 
this number, 8. That's my periodic table. My symbol is O. And then I, on my particular periodic table, I'm looking at this number, 15.998. Some periodic tables just round it up to 16. So let me draw my information here. This tells me my number of protons. And if I have an atom, it's also telling me my number of electrons. And the difference between these two numbers should tell me my neutrons. So let's see, 8 protons. Let's see, 15.998 minus 8. That's 7.998. Well, neutrons don't come in non-whole numbers. I'm going to round that up to my 8. 8 neutrons. And I should have a total of 8 electrons because when we have an atom, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. All right, so there are my 6 electrons in that second level. That was a little sloppy. Sorry about that. Fix that. So I have 8 protons, as it happens, 8 neutrons, and now 8 electrons. Well, how would this thing ionize? Well, I'm going to offer you another rule here. Um, atoms that have five or more valence electrons. And of course, valence electrons are the electrons that are found in the outermost orbital. So atoms that have five or more valence electrons tend to gain electrons in order to fill that level. Now, of course, what we need to realize is how many more electrons are needed to fill this level. And as it happens, two more electrons are needed to fill this level. So if I'm going to draw an oxygen ion Bohr model, I have to think, well, what's going to happen to fill this outer level? Well, two more electrons are probably going to be gained. And if that's the case, I still have eight protons, eight neutrons, and I would have a total of 10 electrons. So let's draw that out, eight protons eight neutrons. Here's my two electrons in the first orbital. And then instead of six electrons in the second level, I would have eight total electrons in that second level for a total of 10 electrons. So oxygen here, it becomes what we call an oxide anion, and we're going to write this as O2 minus, because it gains two electrons to fill its valence level. So we've had a couple of key terms here, anion being one, which indicates that that's a negative ion. All right. This rule is an important one. Atoms that have five or more valence electrons tend to gain electrons in order to fill that level. And when you gain electrons, the result is becoming a negative ion. All right. The other rule that we talked about was when atoms have three or fewer electrons in their valence, they tend to lose them and become positive cations. So that's it for now, ladies and gentlemen.